And you take as much time as you need. God bless you. Amen. Well, you probably didn't hear it, but the preacher said, take as much time as you need. <laughs> I don't know why a preacher say I want to share with you just for a few minutes. <laughs> oh, me. Well, two reasons uh, why I don't preach long anymore. Uh, number one is uh, uh, folk get tired of listening a little quicker today than they used to. Number two is I get tired quicker. <laughs> Oh me! It's so good to be here in God's house today. So Amen. good to so good to see everybody. I tell you, my heart my heart's thrilled on Sunday when we can uh, come to the house of God and fellowship with each other and and worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Amen. One of my favorite writers uh, is uh, I think A. W. Tozer, mm -hmm. and uh, he had a little book one time I read in it. He, and he said. I wonder what in the world has ever happened to worship. Yeah. You know, that, that's almost uh, an unknown thing in many of our so-called uh, churches. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad we still have a few that really love the Lord. Amen. And a few that's really uh, holding to the fundamental truths of the Word of God. Uh, but I'm grateful to, uh, today for the privilege of being here. And thank you, Lord, uh, uh, brother, uh, for the privilege of preaching. And... Uh, uh, I, I really feel like uh, this morning we've sang some of the greatest hymns in our hymn book and we've read some of the m most precious passages in the Word of God uh, today. Of course, I know it's all precious and they're all good. If you want to know what my favorite book in the Bible is, it'll be the one I'm preaching from. <laughs> it changes all the time. But uh, anyhow, uh, we've heard some great scripture readings th this morning and and God, uh, God blesses His Word. Uh, it's been a long time since I've done this, but I used to preach quite often on the Word of God will do the work of God. That is the only thing that will do the work of God is the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. And uh, I want to read another precious passage today. And uh, it's found in Romans chapter uh, number 8. And I always... Uh, I read several verses, and I've told you this before. I read several verses in case you get bogged down on one and go to another one. And uh, but anyhow, I'm interested in uh, in one verse uh, this morning. But I, I believe I could read uh, from verse number 28 through the remaining uh, uh, cha uh, chapter here in Romans, and we could uh, have the benediction and you get up and go, and, and we'd all feel like we've been to the house of worship today. Uh, Romans chapter eight is. For the Christian, Romans chapter 8 is one of the greatest chapters in the, the Word of God yes. For, uh, yes. for the believers. Yes. Now, if I think about unsaved people, I might go to John chapter number 3. But I believe most all of us saved today. Uh, we've all made, uh, most all of us made professions, and, and that, that's great, and I, I'm glad for that. But one thing we do need to, uh, today that is, we, we need to know the Lord. Yes, indeed. We need to know God. Uh, we sang that last hymn, How Great Thou Art. Mm -hmm. We need to know God like He is. Now, I, I understand He's far above us. Uh, we, uh, our thinking is not His thinking. Our ways are not His ways. You, know, you remember, uh, and I'll, I'll just mention this and then I'll read it in a moment. Uh, this is Isaiah chapter number 1 and verse number 18, where God says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Okay. Well, now God can reason with us because He's supreme. He's above us. But sinners, we can't reason with God because we can't get upon His level. But the world's got it backwards today. The world is saying this. They're saying... God, just get right on down here where we are and we want to talk to you. Mm. We want to reason with you. No, that, that's not the way. God reasons with us. Right. And it's a pitiful uh, world that we live in that will not reason with God. That didn't cost you anything at all. Look in Romans chapter 8, verse number 28. I'll begin reading. I'm really interested to, uh, this morning in verse number 29 or, or 30. I've, I've spoke on 29 before. And I'll just mention uh, some things here. I have to because of verse, uh, first statement in verse number 30. 
But let's look at verse number 28, where the Bible says this, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. Now, most professing Christians will quote this verse one time or another. And uh, really what they're saying when they quote it, they say, well, what's going to be is going to be, and we can't change it. Well, maybe that's true. That's not what the, that's not what the verse said. Uh, he says, uh, yeah, God works everything out according to his own purpose. If we love the Lord. Now, if you don't love God, you better watch out. Verse number 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. That's a good word. He also did predestinate. And here's what he predestinated us to. To be conformed to the image of his son. That he might uh, be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we say then? What we say, say then, uh, then say to these things. If God be for us, who can be against us? Uh, there was a colored brother pastoring a colored church in, in the U.S. Uh, years ago. And they was having a bit of a uh, dissension in the church, you know. And uh, he went home and the wife said, and he, you know, preacher really down. The wife said, honey, uh, if God be for us, who can be against us? And the pastor said, a whole church house full of black folk. <laughs> and they're all against him. Uh, but thank God for the scripture. For what saith then, uh, what, we, uh, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? And who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Uh, and who is he that condemneth? Uh, it is Christ that died. Yea, there, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Now listen to it. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation? No, sir. Shall distress? Shall persecution? Our famine, our nakedness, our peril, our sword, as is written for thy sake, we're killed all the day long. We're counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, or any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. I tell you, I believe we could just pray and go home and, and we worship the Lord this morning. But look back, if you will, uh, to verse number 30. The Bible said, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Now, you know, if I'd been writing the Bible, I'd have, I'd have switched it. I said, uh, uh, whom he called him, he also predestinated. But uh, uh, verse number 29 uh, kind of uh, puts it in the right order here. Verse 29 said, for whom he did foreknow. Now, let me ask you the question. Who did God foreknow? Well, let me give you the answer. God foreknew every lost sinner, every whosoever will that would trust in his precious name. Amen. See, we live in a world of whosoever wills and whosoever wants. <laughs> Think about it. Uh, the, the decisions is up to the individual. Uh, God, God put us here and God didn't make us robots. Right. God, didn't, uh, uh, God put us here and gave us uh, the ability to choose. But along with the ability to choose comes the responsibility to choose what's right. right. Amen. Adam chose what was wrong. Mm -hmm. And as a result, uh, uh, we're sinners by nature and we're sinners by choice. And so God foreknew every individual that would trust 
uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, uh, let, let me just say this. Uh, you, I've already mentioned God's on a much higher plane than we are. Amen. We're finite. And God is infinite. Uh, Isaiah said, uh, God said in Isaiah, uh, my ways are not your ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. You see, we can't, we can't lift ourselves up on God's level. Uh, and, and so uh, we have to, God didn't tell us some things. Uh, mankind, they won't know. Well, now, wait a minute, Brother Lindsay. If God knew before the foundation of the earth was laid, who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved, we don't have a choice. No, 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 that's not right. You see, God did not tell us. And you cannot reconcile the fact that God knows who's going to be saved and who's not going to be saved. And God puts the responsibility of choice on every individual. You cannot reconcile that. God didn't tell us. It, it, it's kind of like this. I, I read uh, the story, or we did, uh, of Corey Tim Bone. Bone. Uh, we got we went through Amsterdam trying to find out where uh, the, the hiding place was, you know, and, and we want to know where where's where's uh, the uh, hiding place for Cor, Corey Tim Bone. Boy, they didn't know. Finally, Joyce wrote it down. And they said, oh, you mean Corey Ten Boom. <laughs> oh, me. But anyhow, apparently Corey Ten Boom's uh, mother died in, uh, when Corey was just uh, a baby, just a small child. And so the father is raising the small child. And uh, they always uh, went uh, from uh, Harlan into Amsterdam. Uh, he was a watchmaker and they checked, you know. And so they're, uh, they're on their way one time and Corey's just a little, uh, I don't know, seven, eight, nine year old girl. And uh, she asked her father uh, a question, a woman question, and kind of baffled the father as to how to answer. And so he said, Corey, pick up my bag and carry my bag. And she tried, little girl, she tried to pick up the bag and she, and she said, Papa, it's just too heavy, I can't carry it. He said, well, when you get older, You'll be able to carry it. Oh, yes, I will. I'll carry your bag, Papa, uh, when you get older. And he, then he said, now, Corey, the question you just asked me, you see, you're not, you're not old enough or big enough to carry the bag now. But when you get bigger, you can do that. The question you just asked me, when you get bigger, you'll know the answer. You'll find the answer. And, and that's, that's the way it is with, with God's people. Uh, we, we can't get upon God's level. And so we don't know a whole lot of things about God. He keeps his secret uh, really secret, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he didn't tell us how he created the universe. Well, he did. He said, I, I, I spoke and it's there. Uh, but more mankind today scientifically won't know how. No, God didn't tell us how. Okay, now because of that, because verse 29, he said, Moreover, whom he did predestinate. And we do know we're predestinated to be made into the likeness and the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Then notice the, the second thing, in whom he did predestinate, them he also called. You know, salvation is a call. Now, uh, God did not set you down on a pew somewhere and say, now look, uh, John, I want you to be saved. No, John, I'm offering you salvation. You come and get it. No, God didn't do it that way. But salvation is still a call that comes from God. Uh, many times we can't explain, uh, you know, when God was dealing in my heart about preaching, uh, you know, the Bible said, and the Lord God did appear unto Abraham, uh, back in Genesis chapter number 12. And I said, Lord, you did that for Abraham. Now, why, why don't you appear to me and let me, why don't you tell me for sure that you want me to be a preacher? You see, I wanted to preach. Uh, some way, somehow, God had poured a whole bucket full of preaching me and I wanted to get it out, you know. And I, I come to realize one day I was either going to have to surrender to the preacher or I was going to lose my mind. And I knew if I lost, <laughs> if I lost any what little mind I had, I wouldn't have enough sense to get home. But uh, uh, anyhow, I, I, I was afraid. I, I was afraid God wanted me to preach and I wanted to preach. But I, I was so afraid. Uh, and many times we are afraid to do the will of God. We're afraid to answer uh, the call of God. People say to me all the time, Brother Lindsay, how did, you, how did you know that God 
want you to, to go to Australia and New Guinea. Well, if I knew how to tell you, I would tell you. But I, I don't know how to, uh, circumstances and uh, just all sorts of things. You see, the, uh, before God called me to preach, I remember many years ago, I read the story of John Payton uh, that went from Scotland to the New Hebrides back then. It's a Vanuatu now, those uh, uh, cannibals over there. And brother, God touched my heart then, you know, uh, uh, about uh, uh, the, the world. Uh, that's the field. The world is, is the field. And God, through many different ways, through His Spirit, uh, through the Word of God, uh, through the, the circumstances of life, uh, God works in an individual's life until they respond and answer uh, the call of God. And, and so it is. Uh, whom God predestinated, them He also called. Then you notice the second thing, whom he called, them he also justified. Now that's, that's, that's a great statement. Amen. He justified. You see, God is the only one. He's the only individual that can justify Amen. a sinner. Amen. No one else can. Uh, judges and governors and Presidents and prime ministers, they, they, can, uh, they can pardon people, but they can't justify them. Mm -hmm. I, I remember reading the story somewhere in, in one of the books uh, uh, about D.L. Moody. Uh, D.L. Moody was like Charles Spurgeon. D.L. Moody in America and Spurgeon's in England. By the way, if you go to England and start asking about Charles Spurgeon, uh, not anybody over there can tell you where, where the uh, tabernacle is at, hardly. I mean, we looked and looked and looked until we finally uh, found somebody. And I got over here to Australia. Every time I'd meet an Englishman, I'd ask him, well, you, you must know about Charles Spurgeon. I finally run across one man. See, he said, well, I think about, I think I heard about him. <laughs> but he's a champion where I come from, you know. Uh, if anybody can preach like Spurgeon, brother, you, you, you have arrived. But uh, at any rate, uh, D.L. Moody was a great preacher in America, and he had, a, he had opportunity to, uh, to meet a lot of governors and people in politics and things like that. And one of the governors uh, uh, in, in the States uh, called Moody in one time and he said, Mr. Moody, uh, there, there's a prisoner in, in the prison here in this state, and I, I, I've decided I'm going to pardon him. Uh, he's in for life. And, uh, but the outcry from the public and different people, and I've studied the case, and I'm going to give him a pardon. And he, uh, the governor said to Moody, I want you to take this pardon down to the prison, and I want you to uh, get those men together and, you, and, and give this pardon to this individual. And so they, they, he did, and they, they did. They called 500 inmates in to one assembly. And uh, Moody got up and, and said, now I've got a pardon for one of you individuals here, one, one person. And brother, you can imagine how quiet the audience got then. Nobody knew who, nobody knew who he was talking about, you know. And he finally uh, read the, 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 the letter and the, the name of the individual and the number, I guess, whatever, you know. And of course, you can imagine uh, what joy there would have been uh, in uh, that individual that received the, the pardon. Well, the governor pardoned that inmate, but he didn't justify him. Mm -hmm. He didn't justify him. Only God can justify the sinners. Turn back in your Bibles, if you will, a few pages to chapter number five. And uh, Romans chapter number five is a great chapter uh, that, uh, well, all the book, all the Bible is great, but some, some spots in the Bible, if you ever get a hold of it, and if it ever gets a hold of you, It'll change your life. I'm talking about being justified. The Bible reads like this in verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You'll have peace no other way. You, you, you'll be like the world today. The, the world is worried about uh, uh, the economy. 
The world is worried about the leaders. We just went through the, the change here in Australia. It looked like we're about to go through one in the USA. <laughs> I don't know why I'm laughing about it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for old Donald Trump. He can't help it if he's a smart aleck Yankee. <laughs> ah, but uh, I guess if I had a billion dollars, I might be the same way maybe. But uh, I'm glad God didn't give me a billion dollars. Uh, but I wish he'd give me just a little bit more. <laughs> oh, me. But peace. If, we have, if we've been justified, we're sinners that deserve to die and go to hell. Uh, we're guilty before God. And yet God has devised a way. Man did not devise the way of justification. God did the whole thing. God provided the whole thing. Study the sacrifices in the Bible. And it's God who provides the sacrifice. It's God who offers the sacrifice. It's God that does it all. Amen. The only thing we do, uh, we just let God do it. Mm -hmm. We just let God do the saving. And he does a good job. Let me read on a little bit. He said, uh, uh, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have access by faith into the grace wherein we uh, stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We rejoice in God this morning. Hey, we're, we're wicked sinners. Ah, oh, you say, Brother Andy, I'm not wicked. You just don't know. Hey, <laughs> I'm sorry. If that's what you believe, you might just be the most wicked one here. We're guilty before God. Verse 3, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Now, and verse 4 says, and patience experience and experience hope. Now, this thing of uh, patience, we glory. Uh, let me read it again. And not only so, but we glory in uh, tribulation, also knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Have you ever prayed for patience? <laughs> you're asking for it. Uh, you're asking for it, brother. You're asking for trouble. Tribulation works patience. But I'm glad God is able to give us patience. And as we grow in grace and in knowledge along the way, uh, God does not have to deal with us so severely sometimes uh, if we follow him. Uh, verse number five, it says, And hope maketh not a shame, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, and we were, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for wicked sinners. He didn't die for the self-righteous crowd. Oh, he would have saved every Pharisee uh, that ever existed if they had just simply trusted him. But he came to call sinners to repentance. I read on. The Bible said in verse number seven, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man, some would even dare uh, to, die, to die. But God commendeth his love towards us. Now you, you notice the suffix on the end of the word commendeth. God, uh, I, in the past I read God commended. No, no, that's not right. God commendeth. You see, it's an ongoing thing. It never stops. It never ceases. That, that's what the, that prefix means uh, uh, in, in, in verse number 8. But God commendeth his love towards us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. We ought to rejoice. Really, we ought to rejoice. Now, I'm about to say something that you're going to argue with, or probably. Uh, we ought to rejoice in the world situation, preacher, because Jesus is about to come. Amen. The Lord is about to come. And it just so happens, now I'm not in favor of, uh, of all the wickedness. I'm not in favor of same-sex marriage and things like that. No, sir, that, that's ungodly. That's wicked before God. And yet we live in a world that is turn, turning that, in that direction. Right. We live in a world. It, it, we really have no idea what the world was like 
uh, back in the days of the early church. We have no idea about the, the real persecution, but we do know the Bible says that it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. Right. And when I say we ought to rejoice, we rejoice because we're on the threshold of, of the rapture of the church taking place. Amen. That's what we rejoice about. Amen. We don't rejoice about wickedness. Oh, no, we're, we're, we're against it. Uh, and and uh, I better move on. Uh, I'll say something. <laughs> I'll say something about our ex-prime minister, and I don't. I, <laughs> he ought to be ashamed of himself. <laughs> uh, verse number 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, uh, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. You understand this? Jesus his death upon the cross paid the price Amen. for our sins. Amen. But you understand, His resurrection on the third day makes it possible for us to have life Amen. and live for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Hey, listen, I'm glad somebody in the past uh, was concerned about me. I'm glad that back down the, way back down the line, uh, uh, somebody was teaching and preaching and and praying uh, that uh, Kittus Lindsay would get saved. Oh, thank God for, uh, for ancestors that love the Lord. Uh, I'm thinking my great grandfather that I did not know, uh, K.L. K. Lindsay. By the way, that's King Lemuel Lindsay. <laughs> yeah. uh, boy, they had some names back then, you know. But him and his wife, uh, they, they were charter members of the First Baptist Church in Copper's Cove uh, when it was in, uh, uh, when it came to uh, into existence, you see, uh, because uh, uh, somebody in the past I uh, prayed, I think, for my grandmother, Belle, on my mama's side. Uh, maybe I've told you this before, but it's a good time, good time to tell you again. Uh, God dealt with my heart several uh, weeks or months, I don't know how long, about, uh, about preaching, you know, and and I'd go to the pastor and, I, and say something to him. He said, Lynch, if you can, if you can do anything besides preach, he said, you better do that, you know. Uh, boy, it made, I almost got mad at him, you know. <laughs> I want a little bit of encouragement, you know. And he didn't offer, I'd say something to George. And George said, well, God might be dealing with your heart about preaching, but he ain't, he's not dealing with my heart. <laughs> I, 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 I should have went to Grandma Bell. Uh, after the night I surrendered to preach on Monday morning, pastor's wife went in to see grandma and she's already in the inner night as you know, and blind couldn't see, you know, and, and, uh, Miss Janelle said, grandma, I want to tell you something about Kenneth. Uh, and she, uh, those, uh, old bony fingers and hands, old, Naz old time Nazarene went up like that. And she said, preacher, <laughs> she knew about it and I didn't know about it. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, I think I was reading about justification. That's why I'm going to read on uh, uh, before we get in before we get in trouble here. I, I, I probably ought not to read the whole thing here, uh, but the whole uh, chapter of verse number five deals with this matter of being justified before God. Uh, I like uh, I like certain things. I like this song. Uh, <clears throat> My voice about gone, so I don't think I can sing it, you know. But God held a great glowing balance, and one side was waiting for me. The other side held such perfection that God had demanded there be. And God held the scales in the middle, and my side soared high with its sin. I cried for my side to be balanced. Then Jesus, my Savior, stepped in. Now I'm justified. I'm happy in Jesus today. My sins are forgiven. They're all in the past. They'll never condemn me, for He holds them fast. I'm justified. I'm justified. I'm happy in Jesus today. Amen. Ah, listen. God whom he called, he also justified. Now listen to this. Whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now I'm sorry I don't have a whole lot to say on being glorified. Look back in uh, uh, Romans chapter number 8 in verses uh, 
uh, 17 and 18. Preacher quit a while ago, uh, just before he got to it here. Uh, verse 17, uh, glorified. Think about it. Uh, before, before I read, uh, what about this word glory? How would you define the word glory? You see, that's a God word. How would you define glory? Well, about the best we can do. Peter did the best, I, I guess, uh, uh, in First Peter, or is it Second Peter, uh, when he talked about standing on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he talked about the excellent glory of God. Now, brothers and sisters, we're headed for glorification. Amen. Oh, we're in a wicked world of sin today. That doesn't mean we ought to have sin in our life. That doesn't mean that we ought to go the way of the world. Oh, no. But we live in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, a wicked world. But I want you to know we're headed for glorification. Listen to what the Bible said. Talking about God, or the children of God. Talking about us. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God. Join heirs with Christ. If so be that you suffer with him. That you may be also glorified together. Now listen to what it said. For I reckon that the sufferings of this work present time. Are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Think about it. The glory which shall be revealed in us. It was the Apostle Paul. Uh, God inspired him to say, Yea, and, and, and all that live with godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I believe I said, mentioned earlier, we have no way of really understanding the great persecution that came to the early church. Yeah. I just read a book uh, uh, by William Barclay on the seven churches of Asia Minor in Revelation, and it is unreal at the, the way that those Christians had to suffer. Uh, Ephesus, the first one, maybe they didn't suffer quite so much, but when you get to Smyrna, and Pergamos. Hey listen. They suffer. You see by that time. When you get to the church of Smyrna. This thing of Caesar worship. Had come in. Uh, and uh, let me just mention it. And, and so you kind of understand. Caesar worship. You see. Rome was never against. Really against the Jews. Because of the Jews. Were the economic people. Of the world. They still are today. Uh, if you don't believe that. You, you better just get your head out of the sand. And, and just look around. And, and see, who's got the, see who's got the billions. And the billions. And the billions. And, uh, but it, at any rate. Uh, Rome. Had so many different. Countries and cities. And cultures you know. They had to unify. Uh, some, uh, the, the system some way. And so they come up with this thing. Uh, probably in uh, around the close of the first century of Caesar worship. And what, what, what it was, uh, once a year, every individual in, in particular cities, not all, not all the cities had it, but uh, in Smyrna they did, every individual had to offer a pinch of a sacrifice to Caesar, calling him Lord. Well, a real Christian wouldn't do that. A real Christian would say no. But after, after they did that, the Roman system would give them a certificate and then they could go worship anything they want to worship. They could worship any idol, any, any temple, and all those uh, towns were filled with heathen temples. But a Christian was not going to take a sacrifice and burn it to Caesar and called him Lord. They said no Jesus is Lord. And did you know who the leading. People were against the Christians. It was the Roman Pharisees. See they had the money. And they had the ear of the Roman governments. And so they would inform the government. They'd say this Jew didn't 
burn a pinch of incense to Caesar. Hey, listen, they're in jeopardy. I mean, they, uh, well, they did this like in Smyrna. Polycarp. I'm sure you've heard this before, but you, you, uh, you, know, you need to hear it again. Polycarp, 85 years of age, I think it was. He was uh, the bishop there in Smyrna. And one day the Jews said, they were having some kind of special deal. They said, uh, let's get Polycarp. And so they brought him before the authorities and they stood him there and said, Polycarp, now if you'll, if you'll burn the incense and if you'll denounce Jesus, you can go free. But if you don't, we're going to burn you. And Polycarp, a disciple of John, the revelator. Polycarp said, these 85 or 86 years I've lived and Jesus has never done anything but good unto me. I will not denounce him. I will not burn an incense to Caesar worship. And you know the story. They burned him at the stake, 85 years old. Oh, listen, folk, we can't imagine. We can't imagine what took place. Yea, I reckon the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed Amen. hereafter. Amen. Think about it. Amen. I'm glad to be alive today. Amen. I'm glad to be a child of God. Amen. God help us today to turn our eyes upon Jesus. Brother Paul talking about Peter taking his eyes off of the Lord. And the shortest prayer in the Bible. Jesus save me. And he did. But all because he took his eyes off the Lord. And if we look at this ungodly world. If we look at the ungodly world as systems. Uh, politicians. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, if we take our eyes off the Lord. We'll throw our hands up in despair. But I think we better throw our hands up and praise yes, the eternal God of glory yes, to be alive in this dispensation at this time. Thank God. Whom he did predestinate. That's to be like Jesus. Them he also called. And whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also is going to glorify. Amen. We're already seated with him in heavenly places yes, according to Ephesians. But one day we're going to be in his presence. Amen. Amen. Do you know him? Is he real in your hearts? Our heavenly father, Lord, I pray you'll bless these wonderful passages to our hearts today. I pray, dear God, that you'll bless each individual. Help us to keep our hearts in tune with thee. Our eyes fixed upon the Savior in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. Thank you brother Ken. 617, 617.